developed local people, and every chance I get to have a, a local people, a local person do something, I just press them into service. And uh, this next speaker uh, has only been in federal for two or three months. Six months. Six months. Mm -hmm. And she came by ORI and uh, impressed me, and, and I sort of pick people by my intuition anyway. So uh, it just give me a great thrill to introduce Joy Cafferty. Thank you. Thank you, Harold. Thank you, Gladys, for having me here today. And thank you all for being present and being part of my journey. Just by your being here, you're now part of my journey. Louder. Just speaking louder. Does that work? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Is he doing that or am I doing that? He can do that? Okay, good. <laughs> All right, you can hear me now? Thank you. I'm a hands-on energy healer, a yoga teacher, a mother of three children, a three-year-old, a seven-year-old, and a ten-year-old, so I'm very actively parenting right now. And I'm a, a wife to my husband, Tim, and uh, happily married for the last 13 years. Thank you. <laughs> it is great. <laughs> I recognized my close connection to the divine as a child. And um, as Bessie was talking while she said something, I sneezed two times. Bruce can verify that. He offered me a tissue. <laughs> that, those, those sneezes were incoming information and something that just said, oh, add that to your talk. And what I want to add is that what Bessie was talking about is when they were doing the Christ consciousness work, working with the Christ. And she was saying about when she got into that space of feeling that sense of all-knowingness and, and the all-powerfulness, the all-oneness. And as a child, I had a word for what I felt when I went into that space. I called it getting stuck. And, and the reason I called it getting stuck is because I didn't dare want to move and interrupt this feeling of bliss. So I was just stuck. And that, that bliss, what I would feel is I would feel, I would feel the, the all-knowingness, the all-oneness, and then that would turn itself inside out to the void. And I would feel the peacefulness of the void, the all-nothingness. And that, what a wonderful feeling. I um, was born and raised on Long Island, and then I went to Rhode Island School of Design, and I was a practicing graphic designer for 12 years. Since um, 1991, I um, began doing energy work, energy medicine, although I didn't recognize what I was doing. And then for the last five years, I've been more consciously doing hands-on energy healing work. My intentions of this talk are to inspire, to create hope, to allow each of us to acknowledge our imperfections and still answer to the calling of our soul. I ask myself um, these questions. I ask, I ask myself this question daily, these questions daily. How human can I be? And how much spirit can I embody? My story is a story about the journey of my heart. And over the course of, of this talk, I'm going to share um, three heart stories and a couple of dreams. Okay. About um, 10 years ago, I was in a place in my marriage where I was trying to find a way to share my joy of being connected to spirit, my joy of synchronicity with Tim. And I wasn't quite sure, I wasn't quite sure how to get it through to him, the joy that I felt. And at the same time, I was also going through a period where I was um, reawakening to my gifts from the inner world and my gifts of clairvoyance and clairessence and clairaudience, whatever they all were. And I think in hindsight now that I see the universe operating and, and saying, what Tim and Joy need right now is a really big experience that they can share and dialogue on spirit world. And um, that's what I got. <laughs> One day, um, I was in the car praying and I was saying, God, um, I 
need to understand these gifts of clairvoyance. And if I understand these gifts, um, I'll use them to be in service to the light. So I put that offer out there. And about um, around this time, a year before, in 1989, my husband and I had bought a house in the Seattle area, and we bought a fixer-upper. And we got it for a wonderful price because the house had been um, abandoned and unoccupied for a year. Um, the situation was that the previous owner had died a questionable death, and um, their family wasn't willing to cope or deal with the estate. And so my husband and I, spirit led us to this house, and the house needed to be in relationship with us, and so there we were owners. And as we um, got the keys to the house and signed all the contract papers, we moved in and we toasted to Danny. Danny was the previous owner. And uh, it was a year later, or actually I'm gonna say over the course of that year, um, I would make light of Danny's presence. And I would say things like, Danny, if you're gonna be here, do the dishes. You know, I was hoping that he would be better at housekeeping than I was, but no, no, no good. <laughs> So um, going back to that day when I was in the car and praying, saying, God, I'm, I'm getting these, the, the puzzle pieces of, of the gifts, but I'm not understanding them. So give me the wisdom to know how to use these gifts. And as Rebecca said yesterday, I'm not sure where Rebecca is, but uh, be careful what you ask for, because sometimes you get it and then some. And um, before I start this first heart story, I want to preface with that I'm an avid dreamer. And I have been an avid dreamer since childhood, a dreamer during the nighttime. And I, um, I'm someone who always acknowledged that I had my, my daytime life, my earth walk, and then I had my night life, and it was as active as my day life. And um, so the dream time is really important to me, and it, it brings me immense information. So this one, the night of this prayer in the car, um, this is the experience as it happened to me. Um, in the dream time, that's the word I'll use for my, my time in, in the dream world. In the dream time, Tim and myself and our six-month-old baby went on vacation to a home, to a little cabin. And there we were, and sitting on the floor, relaxing, and the baby toys were out. And then some of the baby toys started spinning. And I knew Melissa didn't do it, and I didn't. And Tim was walking in the room, and he looks at me like, I didn't do that. And so I said, I know, Danny's with us. And I, uh, I say it again, Danny's with us. And I wake up, and I wake up to that thought form, Danny's with us. And then all of a sudden, this is what I felt, I saw and felt this black, blue, the black purplish smoke, and it went <coughs> right into my chest. And I fell back on the bed. And uh, in that moment, Danny came fully into my physical body. And he used my voice, he used my vocal cords, he used my cellular body to say the word, bridge. And at that moment, lots of things happened. First, I felt Danny's grief, and I felt Danny's longing, and I felt his pain. And I also felt like I was gonna throw up. And I thought, I thought, oh my God, if I throw up, I'm possessed, and that's gross. And, so, <laughs> and as, I, as I said, as I thought that, you know, multiple thought forms going on simultaneously, Danny felt my fear, and then he went <laughs> right back out of my chest. But this time it was a silver light, and it went really powerful up like a column and ended up in the corner of my room. And as that, as the, after that happened, I sat up with it, and my entire body was trembling. I, I felt as if a tornado ripped through my body on a cellular level. And I woke my husband up, and he saw me, and I was grieving, and I was crying. I was crying for Danny. I was crying Danny's pain. And he knew, oh, this isn't just one of Joy's dreams. This was more. He could tell. And um, we ended up both staying home from work the next day because this was, this was a big thing. And over the course of the next month, even that very next day, we started trying to find out what was Danny's story? What, what do we need to hear? And we had found out some information, like he was a whistleblower for the post office, whistleblown on some drug incident, and um, had notes that he was being followed, and the, uh, the community thought that he had been murdered. 
And it, it was a mysterious death in that he was missing in July, body found in August, not buried till October. So there was a lot behind it. And I, I even went as far as to go to the coroner's office in the police department. I found, if you, um, I found out you could access any information you want if you live in that house from a previous owner. It's just amazing. And so um, I was able to go and get his death certificate. And in the state of Washington, on this death certificate, it has about 10 of 12 causes of how someone could die. It says homicide, suicide, um, natural causes, um, accidental overdose, or accident, just lists a whole bunch. And in Danny's box, it said, unknown. And it, this, was, this was a mystery. And uh, we, my husband and I didn't know where to take it. And what started happening over the course of those days was um, Danny became a very real presence to me. It wasn't just a light joke anymore. Now I could hear him in the halls. I could hear him in the bathroom. Sometimes I'd be sleeping at night, and i think, oh, Tim's up early for work today, because I would hear walking in the bathroom just very physical. And then I'm like, oh, if that's Tim in the bathroom, who's breathing next to me? And it, it would get confusing. And uh, um, at the same time, um, in Seattle, sometimes they would post notice of rapists in the area. And at that same time, I remember one of those notices was posted. And one night I was sleeping, and in, in a dead sleep, all of a sudden I felt this, this hand on me. And I went into fear. I definitely went into fear. I thought, great, the, the intruder's in my house right now and my eyes are closed, and I thought, and the, like, I was in so much fear, but I thought, I'm not gonna let him kill me without, without me seeing him. And I, I forced myself to open my eyes, and I see Danny, and I'm like, Danny, don't put your hands on my mouth, you scared me. And he was like a little boy, and he, was, he let me know right away, he didn't mean to scare me, he was trying to be polite and not wake up Tim and not wake up Melissa, but he wanted my attention. And I, uh, <laughs> after that, um, after that, he was really cute. He was like a little brother. After that, he'd come to the bottom of the bed and shake my foot. He never put his hand on my mouth again. But I, I was, um, another thing I need to say was, I was um, just recently conceived our second child. And so as I was opening up to allow the spirit in me, I was really also opening myself up to Danny and the rest of the spirit world. And so, um, what became uh, in the beginning as a mystery was now becoming, um, I'm getting woken up an awful lot at night and I'm in my first trimester of pregnancy. And so it, it's, it, it wasn't feeling right. And Tim and I were thinking, maybe, you know, maybe it's not out about us solving Danny's death or his mystery. Maybe there's some other lesson here for us. And so we, we started calling in local psychics and saying, you know, what do we do? I got this spirit walking around my house very actively. And they would try to do some cleaning and you know, he'd go away for a day or two and come right back. And then, um, I'm gonna take another break. We finally got a hold of a woman's name, Shirley Mitchell from the California area that had um, experience in this area. And so Shirley scheduled a telephone conference with us. We went out and got a speakerphone and Tim and I made ourselves available at the right time. And what happened was another, um, a wonderful experience on my journey. At the beginning of the phone call, Shirley let Tim and I know this will be a successful event. And she really empowered us to, to believe that. And uh, Tim was at my feet holding me at a gra as the ground. He used to say, I'm the ground, you're the kite. <laughs> we worked well together. <laughs> so there I was being grounded by Tim. And Shirley was walking me through, um, talking me through a meditation, and she said, Joy, I want you to build this tunnel of light. And I'm very visual, built this tunnel of light. And then I brought the light in, and then I thought, whoa, why am I staying here? Boom, out of my body, I went up into the light. And uh, just as I'm like going through, I decide to turn around and look back at my body. And there's my body, and it's doing this guttural crying, and it's heaving. And it's not my voice, it's Danny's voice. And uh, my husband told me afterwards that he was praying the phone would not disconnect at that point because he knew his wife was not in her body. And Shirley was very conscious of what was going on. And this is what she said very sharply. She said, Danny, get out of Joy's body. Joy, get back in your body. Well, be successful, but you need to stay in your body. 
And that was my first understanding that I ever even left my body. In fact, I began to realize that I was never in my body. I had this very large sign that said vacancy on it. <laughs> and so my first lessons about learning that I go in and I go out of my body, and since then I've learned that you can leave your body, but you can always still keep a cord connected so you know where home base is. So during the course of that release, what began was um, a dialogue. Shirley began asking questions of Danny, and Danny telepathically was answering them through me, almost as simultaneously as she was asking them. And so we uncovered, um, we uncovered the mystery of Danny. And uh, I could, um, the word bridge, what was that word bridge about? Over the course of this talk, it will have several meanings. The, the first and immediate meaning was that um, Danny jumped off of one of the highest bridges in Seattle, the Aurora Bridge. And so that was, that was what, what he was bringing. So it, it turns out in Western terms, Danny was a, a paranoid schizophrenic. But what that meant to Danny was that he was being controlled, possessed by a dog, a dog which was um, an astral being. And uh, so over the course of this release, we, we're working with Danny, then we start working with the dog energy, and then we call into this tunnel of light any entity, energy, element, discarnate that had to do with me or Danny or the dog, and then whew, that tunnel was crowded. It was packed. And so little by little, we released, we transmuted all of those energies into light. And at the end of, um, when we were all done with it, my, my shiny bright tunnel was now filthy and sludgy and muddy. And so an angel and I began cleaning up the tunnel. And as I was doing that, I found a photo that one of the little energies, a little discarnate left. And immediately, without thinking, I just went, I'm out of here, and I went to deliver this photo back to who it was. And so I went up and out of the tunnel. And I, um, what an experience, what an experience. The first thing I saw was all this emerging from this tunnel. It was like a tunnel coming up out of the ground and now I'm on the ground. And I saw Danny. And Danny was a postal worker and that entire year, we, we slowly got rid of all of the things that he had that were still in the house. And one of them was a postal bag, the US mail bag. And it was the last thing that we got rid of just two days before the release. And as I saw Danny, he was transformed and he was beautiful, and he had his postal bag with him. And he looked at me, and what he said to me, has, it's, it's been imprinted, it's imprinted on me. He said, I never knew the sun shone so brightly. And, and he was so beautiful in the saying of it. And I was like, oh, man. And uh, as I was out in this light, I also felt the creator. I felt the source. And the embodiment of his being was so large that I couldn't take it all in visually. But I walked up to that presence. And I um, that's going to bring a box of tissues. <laughs> but I felt, uh, I felt the warmth, what felt like a hand. I just felt the warmth on my head. And then I felt this blessing pour through me. And then I also, uh, Uh, I committed to myself that I'd stay present, but I said it's okay to cry. Okay. So I felt the blessing. <laughs> uh, thank you. <laughs> And I um, clearly felt the words, go back. And those words put me back in my body. I, I got to get there again. <laughs> OK. Thank you. And so, um, one of the things that I love, um, the people in my life, the people in my life have been so empowering. And, and Shirley Mitchell was one of them. And, uh, oh, thank you. All right, thank you, Becky. I got wonderful friends. <laughs> and um, 
Shirley Mitchell said, um, you are a light worker and you have the ability to move between dimensions and you need to use that gift. And I, um, this was all above my head. I didn't really know what she was talking about, but I know what I experienced. And so over the course of the next two years, my husband and I went into this, went into this place, this space, where we had a pullback from daily life and from our friends and from the events, what we were doing, and we really had to feel what was happening. And what, what started happening was once you, once you access something, it's really hard to turn it off. And um, I started hearing discarnates and spirits, and they would come and start talking to me and letting me know they were stuck. And um, I was in a lot of self-doubt, and I, um, I was really afraid of thinking that I was schizophrenic. And so, um, so I would try to pretend I wasn't hearing it. And as that would happen, I would go into um, going into chronic sinusitis and going into getting bronchitis, bronchitis and asthma. So what was happening is I was, as I was trying to turn off my gifts, my body was rebelling. And no, no Western medicine would begin the cure. And I had a wonderful um, husband and a doctor, Stephen Hall, who was our family practitioner, who was extremely open-minded and sensitive to energies. And he um, really empowered me at the time of like, what's going on, Joy? Are you hearing something that you're not telling us? And sure enough, it, I was. <laughs> And so what, what my, Tim and I learned that we needed to do spirit release work. And often it would be in the middle of the night and often it would be during an acute bronchitis or asthma attack because it was what I needed. I needed that much force to like, yeah, you gotta do this, Joy. And so we would go through this ritual when we recognized that I was hearing voices to go downstairs where we did our meditations in our living room. I would create my tunnel of light I would call in the spirit guides. I would center ourselves. Or Tim and I at that time, we were almost working as one because I didn't really have an ability to ground at that time. So we were one, grounded and, and, and flying. <laughs> and I would call in that energy that was communicating to me. And then I would see, I would get an image of that person in their human existence. And I would get information about their life. And oh, we learned incredible amounts of information during that two-year time period. And one of the basic things that we learned was that there were two main reasons why there are discarnates, why there are humans, disembodied humans that did not go into the light. And the one, the one reason is um, they received damage to their head, whether it was um, through a bullet, an airplane crash, a car crash, traumatic, traumatic head injuries. And uh, during that time, while Tim and I were in that two year period, spirit led us to a lecture by Melvin Morse. And Melvin Morse, this was in the Seattle area. Um, he has a book out, I believe it's called Closer to the Light. And he was paid by the government to study over a 20 year period, all of the near death experiences that went through children, Seattle Children's Hospital. So we studied children's interpretations of their near-death experiences. And he tracked them over a 20-year period. And he was being paid by the government to do this. And with some of that research money, what some of his colleagues had done was go back and look through medical books. And they found back in the 1950s, they were doing experiments on the brain. And um, in one of these experiments, they would cut open someone's skull while they were alive, lift it up, and, and put probes into the brain and see, oh, this moves the finger, this does that, that creates speech. And one of those places, when they probed it, the person would say, oh, I'm leaving my body. Oh, I'm going up and out of a tunnel of light. And so there was a place mapped out on the brain that would trigger a near-death experience. And what this was Melvin Morse's interpretation, what he wanted to relay during his speech was, um, the good Lord gave us a way to birth into the world and he also gave us a physical, a physical embodiment, a physical capability to release us into spirit world. But what happens in physical head traumas and in, in today's technology, in today's culture, in today's society, we have trauma to the head. We have bombs and we have explosions and we have airplane crashes. And so those releases that I did, um, they, missed, they missed their tunnel of light. 
And so what I was doing was I was offering them a surrogate experience. I was creating a tunnel of light for them and bringing in their spirit guides. And together we would transmute their being into energy and, and take it up into the light. As I did that, when a spirit was ready, when a discarnate was ready, it would shift from showing me its human form, you know, its etheric body, to being a geometric light shape. And then I knew it was ready to move into the light. And then I had another set of beings that were trapped that didn't have head injuries. And they were trapped because they put themselves, they placed themselves into a self-imposed hell. And that self-imposed hell came from their shame, and it came from their guilt, and it came from fear, and it came from self-loathing. Their judgment day was self-judgment. The universe, God, the Christ consciousness, whatever you want to call it, it is present with open arms waiting to receive each and every one of us. Our hell, hell is what we make it. And so when I would work with those energies, it was a lot more difficult. And it, it became a, a counseling session. It became a psych. And Tim and I, again, we would just work together. Incredible times. And um, what it would happen sometimes that I would, I would have to bring that person to a place far enough back in their consciousness where they could remember their radiance and remember their love. And sometimes that was taking them back to you know, conception or somewhere in their childhood. And I would just cradle them and I would hold them and I would love them until they could feel enough love to release themselves into the light. Ah. <laughs> it was beautiful. <laughs> okay. Ah, that was a wonderful time. I want to um, explain why Danny, Danny's word bridge was a concrete physical word. But Danny to me was a bridge to, my, to the journey of my heart. And I want to explain why did he need to come into my heart and reawaken me. I had um, a friend in college, Joe, and I'm sure that we've probably had lifetimes together. He was my best friend and lover and a soulmate. And I think that Joe and I made an agreement that in this lifetime, his death would spark my life's work. And so um, six months after college, um, one day I was on Long Island and Joe was in Alaska. And one day I was driving the car and I lived on this, this uh, road where it's heavily monitored by uh, radar, so 30 miles an hour, driving nice and slow. And all of a sudden I felt this rush of speed and I felt a crash through my body. And all I could see was a bicycle wheel spinning. And I didn't know what happened, but I was, I was pushed into prayer. Where I, I, I all of a sudden realized something profound in my life just happened and I needed to pray. And that, um, I prayed for 20 minutes before I felt a sense of closure or peace, where I felt like, okay, it's all right. I got a phone call the next day while I was at work that um, the day before, Joe was riding a bicycle and he was hit by a van. And it was the same time that, that with the hour difference between Alaska and Long Island. And so I, uh, I went to his funeral in uh, East Haven, Connecticut. And I allowed myself to go into my grief. Right there in the funeral home during the wake, I just said, oh, I'm there. And I opened up and I grieved. And I grieved from every cell in my body. And I was letting myself go deep into this grief. And uh, it, began, it, it became an experience for me, a very physical experience. And I began undulating and I began moving. And what happened was this energy began rising up through my root chakra, through my second, through my third, through my heart. I was in hindsight having a kundalini experience. But um, it wasn't recognized as that. I have a mom that's a nurse and uh, I wasn't able to perceive the spiritual event that was happening for me. And her perception was my daughter's having a nervous breakdown. And uh, I was very at peace. For me, I was going into this Think, think 23-year-olds and think sex, a very orgasmic 
place of grief. And um, my mom orchestrated having six young males physically pick me up and carry me out of the funeral home. And what that felt like to me was being ripped apart from copulation and ripped apart at the heart. It was like, <sighs> And what happened next was, I want to preface this a second. When I was younger, my, my spirituality, it was so wonderfully naive. There was me, and there was God, and there was this direct, beautiful white cord between us, and that was all. It was so simple. And then as this rip at the heart chakra, I, um, all of a sudden, I, I, I completely opened up to the astral world. And I saw every discarnate and astral boogie and everybody's aunt and grandma and uncle and whoever, and it was all way too much for me. And I told God, I said, oh, I can't handle seeing all this right now. All I want to do is grieve. I just want to grieve. And so I went, <laughs> I tried shutting it off and shutting it down. Because what I needed to do in that moment was grieve. And I needed to grieve for the whole next year. <sighs> okay. <sighs> so um, for me, the experience of Danny was bridging me back to that time, back to, back to the Kundalini experience, back to the broken heart. I want to go into um, some dreams now. I had, um, after, after Joe died and before the Danny experience, I had a dream about my life's task and uh, the dream went like this. Um, there was earthquakes and tornadoes and volcanoes and disruption and then some survivors. And then there was another level of destruction and volcanoes and earthquakes and uh, rising to a higher pl plateau and less survivors. And then one more and then less survivors. And there I was high up in this monastery with a handful of people. And the weight of the world was on me. A couple of people were just running around and I was looking at him, how can we be here? Can't you feel the responsibility? We're here after all of that violence and destruction. And I, I was just going into, why am I here? And in exasperation, I just looked up and said, God, why am I here? And I am, I am so blessed that in the dream time, when I ask God things, whew, he's right there to answer. And so he takes out a piece of paper and he writes down in black ink on a piece of paper and he rips it off and he hands it to me. And I'm holding this sheet of paper and, it, and, and I'm thinking, I'm in a dream and I can read the writing. You know, you know how hard it is sometimes to read the writing? But there it was and I read it and it said, to love mankind. And I look up incredulous, to love mankind? That's all? <laughs> And so I get this smirk from God, and he pulls the piece of paper back, and telepathically he's like, okay, you want more? <laughs> and so he writes down something else, and he hands me the piece of paper, and now it says, to show mankind how to love. To show mankind how to love. Oh, man, that's big. <laughs> that's really big. And so I sat with it for a while to show mankind how to love. Where do I start with that? I start with it right here. I should move this thing over my heart. You should have said, this is a heart talk. <laughs> no speaker wires. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I start with it right here. How much can I love myself? How deeply can I accept my imperfections? Can I go into holding a loving space for the part of me that I contract on? Can I hold a loving space for my guilt and my shame and for my self-loathing? Can I bring that into compassion? And how, how can I really, really, if you think about this, how can we really accept the love from another person if we're not loving ourselves? 
Are we asking them to do something that we can't do for ourselves? And think about how are you really receiving it? How can you really be receiving love from another person? What are you really receiving if you can't receive your own love? What kind of pseudo solution are you trying to get from them if you're not loving yourself? So think about it. If we could love ourselves, how much more can other people love us? And how much more can we receive the wholeness of their love? If I can love myself, what a better relationship I have with Tim. And what a better relationship I have with Joy and with Natalie. What a better relationship I have with my children if I can love myself. Because I can be whole for them. And if I can be in a place where I'm not judging myself, then how can I hold a place of judgment for them? I'm not going to judge them. Because I can accept the wholeness of me. I love that. I just do. And so I, um, that brings me to another dream. A dream that helped me understand um, my imperfections. And it helped me, yeah, Joy, you're imperfect, but keep, keep going on with that calling. Now, this is a dream. It's six months after the Danny experience. I know, because now I'm six months pregnant. And in the dream time, I'm pregnant. And there's Tim, and there's Melissa, and a host of friends. And we're going on a hike. And we've been hiking all day long. And it's evening, about 5 or 6 o'clock, and we're going to set up camp. But I see a cabin up ahead, and I'm pregnant, and I'm tired, and I have my little 3-year-old. So I tell him, I'm going in the cabin, and I'm just going to bed. There's a bed for me there. And the rest of them set up camp and do their stuff. And as they're setting up camp, they realize that on the lower ridge, there's some other campers. And lo and behold, one of them got hurt. And my friends go into this very mental and cognitive place. And they start wondering, uh, should, we, should we help this person? And if we should help them, how should we help them? And what technique should we use? And who's going to help them? And blah, 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 blah. And over the course of that, that camper dies. And my husband, Tim, he, he's mortified. And in the dream, he brings in this corpse to me. And he wakes me up. He's like, Joy, Joy, from all our talk and thinking, we let, we let him die. And Tim goes running out. And in my mind, I'm thinking, but the story's not over yet. We have to bring him into the light. Remember, I'm starting this release work, and I'm bringing people into the light. And so I take this corpse, and I drag this body, this dead body, into the light. And now there's another room. There's my room of intellectuals and the room I came from, and I'm in this hallway of light. And I just open myself up from my heart, and I just start praying. I just put my hand on this person's heart, and I start praying. And then I feel this choir of angels. And uh, as, I, as I hear that choir of angels, I'm still praying, but the corpse now isn't a corpse. And he looks up, and he looks at me. All right, all right, I'm alive. I'm like, OK, OK. And I wasn't even thinking that. You know, I'm thinking into the light. But now this person came alive. I was blown away. And um, you know what, those angels? I heard those angels for three days before they fell back into my memory bank. It was beautiful. <laughs> and I woke up from this dream, and every particle of my room was the source of light. My entire room was filled with light. And this was the message I got. It was, you know, Joy, yeah, you're imperfect, but you come from your heart. And you have a gift. And you have the gift of love. And I, I need to um, let you know where my insecurities were at the time was um, I have a reading disability, and I don't read very well. And I've always been insecure around intellectuals and academia. And that dream was just saying, just forget about that. Don't worry, that's not you. This is you. Still, Joy, answer to the call of your soul. I, I love dreams. I'm, I'm going to put a book together on the healing power of dreams. They're cool. <laughs> and so it shall be. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
Hmm. So now I'm on my journey. I'm going to answer to the calling of my soul, and I'm going to I'm going to find out more ways I can love myself. And one of those ways, the spirit led me to uh, one of those whole life expos. And there is a woman there named Ana Isalas, and I didn't understand anything that she wrote up in her program about her talk, but spirit put me in the classroom. And uh, her work was on a real higher vibration. And she empowered us to um, access the silver violet, violet ray of light. We did a meditation and we accessed it. And then she was showing, she pulled someone from the audience and she was demonstrating energy healing work on their arm. And at that time, I didn't understand that I was an energy healer. And I thought, um, I have also, I have to say this too, I, one of my insecurities, I knew that I was hardly ever in my body. And so um, I, I um, mistrusted anything about the physical world or felt like, oh, I don't know anything about the physical world. And so I thought when you hear about people doing healing work and they looking into someone's body, you know, they're seeing, I thought they were like, seeing into this physical body, like ripping open the skin and seeing cells and muscles and bones on the physical body, not the etheric body or not the emotional body. And so I'm in this workshop and I'm just clairvoyantly, although I didn't understand it, looking to this person's arm and I'm seeing what's going on. And then I, I tell on the ease and she just says again, some empowering thing back to me. And I was just impressed with the whole thing. And after the workshop, I couldn't even articulate anything that happened to Tim with Tim. I don't know, it was just one of those experiences, but I was really moved by it. And so I ended up taking, she had a two year program that she ended up bringing to Seattle on energy medicine. And uh, oh, I wanna, I wanna bring in another heart story. Uh, let me grab this. Can you get me more water? Sure. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Um, Okay, so this heart story, um, I mean, um, Ana East Head would have a five-day basic before her two-year program. And in the basic, um, we'd be going through the chakras one day at a time and one level at a time. When we're at the fourth, the fourth day in the fourth level of the field, the heart chakra. And um, as, as we work in this classroom, the entire room is vibrating on that energy level of the fourth level of the field. And uh, she writes down on a board the 12 steps to energy healing and she, of, of astral healing or something. And she writes them down. And every one of those steps were steps that the spirit guides had given me during the, that two year of spirit release work. When I, when I was in that two year program with Tim, I didn't, all of my teachers were just guides. And I, or even the um, discarnates themselves, they were teachers, all, all teachers. And so she wrote this down. It was my first affirmation in the physical realm. I'm like, oh. I didn't even understand all this was real. You know, I were what? I didn't understand anything about it. But anyway, she wrote all this down. I get this affirmation and the, the classroom's vibrating. And at a certain point, all of a sudden, my hands are clutching my heart. And I have to run out of the classroom because I can't handle the energy. And I, I tear out the back fire door. And I'm sitting in the fire escape area and I'm breathing. I'm like, Joy, why are you running away when this is, this is heart stuff? What are you running away from? Why are you running away? And I was like, oh. I'm just like breathing really hard and you gotta get back in that classroom. So I go back in the classroom, clutching my heart, <laughs> breathing really hard. <laughs> and Anna East looks at me and says, Joy, what's going on? And I put on one of my masks. I don't know. <laughs> And I look down and I see my heart chakra and I see what happened from the Kundalini experience. And I see what happened when Danny came through it. My heart chakra is ripped open. It's ripped open. And our heart chakras, they're our energy, they're our centers to process energy. But there I was in that classroom and it was vibrating at the fourth level of the field and I wasn't doing too good processing the energy because it was ripped open. And Ana East looks at me and she just simply says, Joy, when are you going to sew that heart chakra? And what a gift she gave me. She didn't come over and say, oh, let me fix that for you. She empowered me. And then in this part of the story, I think of Harold, because Harold has this little table of all his tools on it, right? Well, there I was, and this was like being in the trenches. My heart chakra was ripped open 
and I don't see any tool tape, well, I don't even know to look for one, but all of a sudden in my hand, there's a needle and a thread. <laughs> and so I just start stitching up that heart chakra as if I'm on a mesh unit, just doing the best repair job with the least amount of knowledge that I have, you know, or whatever, working with the knowledge I have, which wasn't very much. My first repair job. <sighs> I love heart stories. And so uh, a bridge, why else bridge? Where else does that come in? Our heart chakra is the bridge between our physical body and our spirit body. Our heart chakra bridges levels one, two, and three, the first, second, and third level of the field with five, six, and seven. The bridge, the heart. Okay. Mm. So during um, the gift I gave to myself during that two-year energy medicine program was the gift of going into all of who I am. I let myself open up to my shame, and I let myself open up to my guilt, and I did all kinds of digging. What does my killer look like? What's my lower self look like? So even though it was an energy medicine class, it was a class about personal transformation. It was about making this vessel clean. <sighs> what a gift. Okay. So I want to go into, um, where are we on time? Okay, pretty good. Some of my um, healing techniques. Let's start it with the beginning. Um, before I put my hands on somebody, I open up my root chakra and I go deep down in my root chakra and I come out into this place I call the womb place. I'm deep down in the shamanic earth world. And I, um, I walk up to this tree trunk and I go inside and, and there's this place that waits for me. It, it's always there. And if I'm gonna be working on a client, my client's there before me. And in that space, I find out information about my client. In that, in that space, my client creates, they create something to give me information. Uh, an example that comes off the top of my head, I had a woman who received an inheritance and she was um, um, going through self-worthiness issues. And so in my, in my womb place, she creates this room that's filled with gold and diamonds and all these beautiful shimmery things, but we couldn't go in it. We had a hoover on the outside. And, and they'll do all kinds of things. They'll create tunnels, they'll find little nooks and crannies they want to hide in because they don't want anybody to see them or whatever is up for them, they show me. And I also find out in this womb place, what aspect of this person am I going to be dialoguing with during the healing? Is it going to be an aspect of their inner child? Is it going to be a part of them that's in pain? Is it the part of them that's in physical pain? Sometimes, often, I'll, st I'll, I'll hook up with a part of them that's willing to be in transformation, that's willing to be in healing. And so it's the part of them that's moving forward. So I find out who I'm going to be dialoguing with. And then after I get that connection, I let the story go as long as it feels right. And then I, I'll go through my chakras and I, I, I look at my root chakra. What, what issues are up for joy today in her, in her root chakra? And I look at them. I see what's my stuff. So I know before I go into the healing session. And then I look in my second and my third and my fourth and I go up my chakras and I check all of my issues. And I feel all of my imperfections. And then I say, God, here I am. Look at all these issues. Look at all these imperfections. And then I, and then I go into a place of complete trust. And I almost, I almost get this falling back sensation, like I, I fall into trust. And in that moment, all of my chakras are cleansed. And I, I know who I am, I know my imperfections. And this is where I can answer these questions. How human can I be? I know, I know because I look. And then after I, I answer that, how human am I in this moment? Then I say, how much spirit can I embody? And I open myself up as that channel of light and of love. So I connect myself after I clean my channels and I go into trust, then I go back down on Mother Earth until I feel a connection. Okay, I'm grounded, I got my Earth connection. And then I go up into the, I work with the Christ consciousness, but one day it might be Father Sky or Shiva, whoever, a masculine form of divinity, I connect. And then I allow myself to fully surrender into compassion. And I allow unconditional love to flow through me. And when I'm in this ready state, then I place my hands 
on my client. And you know what I do? I love them. And I'm, I'm, as, as uh, Bessie said, I am so present with them. I am so presently loving that person. My heart just pours out, and I feel me. I feel joy, and I feel spirit. And I feel the spirit guides come in. Whoever, whether it's theirs, mine, or my other clients, they just come in and they be present. And so the work that I do, it could be, I'm working on all seven levels of the field. Now I'm not, because it's like I've been slowly grounding into my physical body, I don't have as much of a natural tendency to get right into the physical or the etheric. But if it's real up for my client, then I'm there. So I work on emotional things, spiritual things, whatever is happening. And the way that I work is I'll start, I might start at, I'll, my intention is to start at the ankles because it's a safe place to start for my clients and I'll work my way up the body unless I get guidance otherwise. Unless I get guidance, they'll go right to the heart or go right to the head. And so what I'll do is I'll put my hands on their feet and then I'll work from an ankle to a knee and I just track information. I'm tracking how's the flow, what's how's the flow of their energy, what are the stories. And this is another thing I really want to share with you. I don't find energy blocks because I don't believe in energy blocks. Energy blocks sound like we have clogged plumbing or something. <laughs> you know what I find? I find stories. I find information that's just waiting to move from the subconscious to the consciousness. And those stories are rich and they're powerful. And so that's what I do. I just discover the stories. And I find out if are they willing, are these stories ready to be told? And I check in with my client and see how they're doing. And so I just, I go with the flow of it. And I just check and sometimes I'm told to bop around, like sometimes I'm told, go to the fourth level, work on an astral healing, or go on here, or whatever. Hold, hold the first, second, and third simultaneously, or hold this, you know, I'll be told what, what levels to be, to be stimulating or vibrating at. And then I'll have a running dialogue of, you know, I'll hit somebody's story and that triggers one of my stories, but I'm not gonna go there because this is their time. I'm in service to them in that moment. And so I'll have, I have this one, one voice in the back of my head that's, that's theirs, that's theirs, that's yours, that's theirs, that's theirs, that's yours, that's yours. <laughs> <laughs> and that running dialogue, all the ones that are mine, it, it gives me feedback later on so I could go into my own meditation and say, oh, what was that about for me? But that's not my time to do it. My time is to be present. I am in service to that person in that moment. One of the things that's been coming in real strongly, if we have time, I might demonstrate it just to offer you a gift, is toning. And um, the toning has been working like this. It's, it's reminding me of whales and dolphins where they're sending out sounds and they're getting feedback. Well, I've been doing this toning that's been, sometimes it feels like that, that I'm toning and I'm sending out sounds and then I'm getting feedback. I'm getting feedback on three-dimensional energetic space as it's happening. And then sometimes the toning looks like this. It looks like I'm becoming the voice of their pain or of their energy or whatever is running through their field. And then I'm becoming the voice of the divine. And then it's a dialogue. And then it's beautiful and it goes into this oneness of what is. And so that's how the toning it's been. And it's been getting really powerful and really strong and I'm just going there lately. I wanted to, uh, yeah, a couple other stuff. Um, Bessie had talked about an energy cord healing. And energy cord healing, as Bessie uh, revealed, it's one of the fastest, fastest ways to get immediate impact. And energy cord work is about being in relationship. And uh, we all have energy cords that we're, to every person that we're in relationship with. And these cords can be loving and powerful, or they can be unloving and dysfunctional. Um, I share a couple of cord stories. I have um, a woman named Jeanette I work with over the telephone. And um, I work, when I work with someone long distance, I stay on the telephone with them during that healing session. And over the course of this couple of days, I realized, you know, I probably do that because I have three kids and that's my way to define my time clearly. Mommy's doing healing work now, don't bother her. <laughs> you know, or if I was just doing meditation, they might come in and out. So Jeanette and I are working and Jeanette's mother had, um, her breast removed from some cancer and now Jeanette is working with a lump that she has in her breast. And so we end up doing cord work. I go into Jeanette's consciousness from Jeanette's heart. I go through a cord to her mother. 
And from that place, we can learn empathy of what is that person going through. And one of the things I saw in that healing session, I saw Jeanette all connected up like a puppet to her mother. All these dysfunctional cords so that Jeanette, Jeanette wasn't Jeanette, Jeanette was a puppet. And Jeanette could feel all of it, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And so we vaporized all of those dysfunctional cords, <laughs> lovingly and respectfully returning to her mother what was hers. And Jeanette claiming for herself her own being. And Jeanette was so moved by that session. She, she is in a new dynamic relationship with her mother. She said she no longer relates to her mother from that place of woundedness. And her mother can no longer now relate to Jeanette in the same way. Because now Jeanette comes to her from a place of her wholeness. And um, Jeanette was so moved by the experience that she told her sister-in-law. And her sister-in-law, Lisa, calls me on the phone and says, I have a 15-year-old. We have to talk. We have to work. And so the 15-year-old has been um, lying and stealing and doing things to intentionally get caught. And it's her stepson. And she's like, I need to understand him. And so we set up a healing session. And same thing. I go through Lisa, through her heart, and to the 15-year-old. And I give her the perspective of her 15-year-old. I let her know the longings and the pain from his perspective that she didn't have insight to. So instead of seeing it from a place of judgment, she's like, oh, I didn't know he was feeling that. He never revealed that to me. And anyway, we do our little healing session. And we hang up the phone, and this is what happens. Her 15-year-old son was downstairs on the couch. And she was upstairs in her room doing the healing session with me. And the 15-year-old knocks on the door, holding his heart. And he says, Mom, what just happened? Who were you talking to? Something happened. My heart feels different. And they opened up to a two-hour conversation about what they needed to dialogue on. And she, she called me the very next day, and she sent me a letter. The court work is beautiful. It's so, it, it really, what it teaches is empathy. And it really helps you to see something from someone else's perspective. And I have um, my, own, my own cord work stories. I have a brother that um, we chose to be born right near each other, just like 14 months apart or something. So the beginning of my childhood, we obviously spent a lot of time together. And um, it, my perspective was his intentions in childhood and growing up in his teenage years was to kill joy because Joy was definitely born too close to him and was taking attention away from him. And that's truly, I mean, to the point where you know, when I was in my 20s at one point, he literally had his hands around my throat. And uh, so I didn't have much communication with him in, in those later years, my 20s. And during my two-year program, I did energy cord work with my brother. And sure enough, just like Bessie said, a couple days later, out of the blue, you know, I love that expression, out of the blue. You know what that is? That's out of the causal body, the fifth level of the field, out of the blue, comes a phone call from my brother, just wanting to talk. And uh, he, he had gone through his own personal experience of a child dying and all of us, a couple years before, and he just wanted to talk to me. And our relationship profoundly changed from that day on. And the very next time that I went to a family reunion, like six months later, or I, or yeah, I was just, I forget, I was visiting Florida anyway. I always believed he, I was the last person he ever wanted to see. And now I'm going to Florida, and he asked, can I pick you up at the airport? I was blown away. You want to pick me up at the airport? Yeah, yeah, sure. And we talk, and it's, it's a th two hour drive or something. And we just start saying, you know, when you did this, I felt this. And when I did that, and da 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 da, we just went, we just rehashed childhood. And we let each other know how we felt. And I was in a place, because after doing that cord work, I was in a place of empathy, and I was in a place of being able to do it. I was no longer victim. I was, I was owning my own power. And uh, our relationship now is incredible. He calls me for healing sessions. And uh, I called him a couple days ago and said, Louie, what should I say about us? And I'll talk in my talk I'm doing. And he said, well, first I've, I've been doing healing work where, um, especially since his daughter died, um, he, he goes into um, panic and can't sleep at night. And since we've done, we've done two healing sessions, he goes into panic of death. And uh, he's been able to sleep for the last 
um, I'd worked on him one month and he was able to sleep a month fine, and then just started creeping back, did it again, and, and he said, completely gone. He can go to bed and sleep at night. So anyway, I asked him, what should I say? And he said, this is, he's cute, this is what he said. He goes, Joy, remember Star Wars? Remember Princess Leia and Luke? And they found out they were sister and brother. That's how I feel. Mm -hmm. And then he said, so you think maybe I could still be a Jedi Knight? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can. <laughs> you are. <laughs> how cool. <sighs> OK. I share one um, physical body healing. And this was in my early, in my early days when uh, I'm just beginning doing healing work, hands-on hand energy work, and I wasn't sure what I was doing, but I was going with it. And I had a friend who was an ultimate Frisbee player. Ultimate Frisbee is a sport that racks knees and ankles. And she had torn ligaments in her knees, and um, the doctors recommended surgery to her, and she was looking for alternative treatments. And so she didn't know what to think about energy medicine at all. But what she trusted was me. She was watching me blossom into my story and into my journey. And so she was on the table, and sure enough, I'm at her feet, and I'm moving from my ankles to her knees, and stories are pouring out for me. I'm just feeling these stories, and I'm revealing them to her. I don't remember the details of them now. But I, what I felt was a shift. I felt, you know, I'm telling the stories, and all of a sudden, I'll feel when things shift. And I felt that shift happen. And on the table, I was checking in with her. She's like, no, I don't feel it. I don't feel a shift. I'm like, OK, let's just go with it. Let's trust it. And the next day, she went home, and she started riding her bike. And then she started running. And then she was playing ultimate frisbee again. And this happened short, shortly. Um, I worked on her shortly before I moved from the Seattle area. So I called her back a week ago. And I said, Lisa, whatever happened to your knee? And she said, Joy, after you worked on that knee, I played solid for a year on it with nothing, no injury, playing ultimate frisbee, which is a really um, a sport tough on the body. And she said, now, you know, now it has good days and bad days, but she's still been active on it. So of course, my thought, good days, bad days, whoa, let's eliminate those bad days. <laughs> but it, it, it's, it was a physical body healing, and she was doing fine. And I, that's that, like me, I don't often always go back and track how people are doing. You know, sometimes it's fun when you get the feedback, but I don't always actively go seek it out. It was fun having to organize it for this talk and calling people, huh, how was that? <laughs> um, I wanted to share a story about Big Grant, and then I'm almost done. Uh, I had the opportunity to work on one person for a year every other week because he was my case study for the two-year program I was in. And Grant was, um, was a musician, and he was doing lots of detoxification, liver cleansing. He was going through AA. And um, Big Grant, you know, Grant was big, but his angelic counterpart, Big Grant, that's what I ended up calling him, was really big. Big Grant was, was Grant's higher self. And when he come in, he would like be bending at my ceiling, you know, trying to fit in my room. But he was, so over the course of that year, I developed a relationship with Big Grant. And, and sometimes he was waiting for me before if I was running late for the healing session. He let me know. He was there. He'd been waiting five minutes. <laughs> but um, Grant was also seeking alternative, other alternative work, Chinese medicine and um, acupuncture. And what developed over the course of that year is that Grant, um, Big Grant would come in and he would study Grant's meridians. And then he would come in and place <coughs> in grants on the astral realm and place into grants etheric meridians, acu acupuncture needles. And it was so clear to me, it was just completely, he'd actually come in my body, study grant, and then go out of my body and go around and place these needles. And I got out a chart and I would track them. And then we gave them to Jim Blair, um, grants acupuncturist at the time. And Jim Blair was wonderfully open and he would use these acupuncture, acupuncture points that were given. And we'd asked him, we asked Jim, what do you think? You know, what are these points? Because they, they were actual points that, that were in Chinese medicine, but they um, weren't the traditional system of using them. And he said, you know, they're not traditional, but they make sense for Grant. And that's all I needed to know. And um, I've been starting to do energy work at the New Moon Spa in Eureka Springs. And I'll get a client, and I'll have just met that client for literally like 30 seconds, you know, maybe a minute. You know, sometimes I'm working on them right after they got in a massage, and I don't even get to always see their sheet, um, the info about them. So I go to work on this one woman, and Big Grant shows up. Big 
come in, what are you doing here? It's been a while. You know, it just comes right in, and I could just see. And so I'm, I'm working on her, and sure enough, he starts studying her meridians and starts placing acupuncture needles on her. And so over the course of the dialogue, I find out that she regularly sees an acupuncturist. So acupuncture was one of her forms of a healing modality, and it was one that she was receptive to. And so there was Big Grant being able to feed me the information. And, I, and there's a host of other guys, people, um, other clients' guides that I got to know over time. And um, they come in, they come in, like there's a shaman that comes in, and this other, they come in at the right time. They know when to be there. And, and I trust all of it. And I'm so grateful for all of it. <sighs> okay, I've got a couple of, I want to just summarize with some personal life philosophies. <sighs> As a child growing up, somehow I knew that life was about love. I knew that. And then when Joe died, um, I went through a period where I was, life is about love and death is about peace. And I want to share a couple of things about Joe. Um, Joe and I are in dynamic and active relationship. He comes into the dream time and we catch up with each other. And usually I see him every couple of months and I'll, we'll fill in each other. And one point, um, several years back, he came to me and he said, I'm going on a journey, you want to come? And I was like, yeah, the, my, the, my spontaneous me, yeah. And then uh, I look around and I see Tim and I see my diapers and the baby bottles and the pacifiers and I'm like, no, nah, I can't. And then he was gone for a year. I didn't see him in the dream time for a whole year. And then he came back. And wow, was he transformed. It was incredible. I saw it in his energy field. I could see his transformation. And what I've, the knowledge that I understood is that um, where he went for that year is that a part of his soul was incarnating in New Zealand. And he went to give witness to that incarnation from an aspect of his soul. And the other thing I wanted to share was, um, you know, um, chronologically, Joe had died. And then years later, I was doing that spirit release, the very first one with Danny. And when um, Shirley Mitchell was asking, OK, we cleared out the tunnel, she goes, is there anything left? Is there any other, any other energy you feel after all of those in there? And then I go up and I check. And I see Joe at the other end of the tunnel. And he's right there, and, he's, and I, I know this is Joe. And she thinks it's another discarnate. I'm like, no, no, it's not a discarnate. And he's just checking in on me. You OK? Yeah, I'm OK. And then he would just come in every time I created those tunnels of lights. You OK? Yeah, I'm OK. Just checking, checking that I was doing my work and doing it well, doing it comfortably. <sighs> and uh, another thing I've come to understand is that life is about the creative expression of our unique embodiment of divinity. Because yes, we all have the divine within us. And we all have our unique embodiment of that divinity. And we all have our unique way of expressing it. And hell is what we create. And don't forget that. <laughs> and if you can, work on your barrier material. Work on it now so you don't have to do it later. Work on that shame and that guilt and allow yourself to hold a compassionate place in your heart for it. We all have those. We all came from a place of wounding. We're all human. It's the human experience. We all have it. Just love it. Find a place in your heart to open up to it. And just the, the importance of self-love. Just compassion. Love yourself. Love yourself first. And from that love, expand to those you're in relationship, and then expand to the larger community, and expand to the, to the universe. Ah. Namaste. Yes. <laughs>